Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we'll be starting with our uh, next session on solar power. And I want to ask for the people in the audience, who's, uh, are there people active in the energy space, renewable energy space? One, two, three. So uh, what is interesting to know about our next speaker is his career path. In 1976, he started in renewable energy, went on to work in nuclear energy, then coal, then gas. And in 1996, he made a decision. I want to stick to solar energy because I believe that that is the future. And fast forward till today, he founded the American Council for Renewable Energy. And right now, he's the managing director and a global head of environmental finance and sustainability of Citigroup, one of the largest banks uh, worldwide. Please welcome on stage Michael Eckert. <clears throat> Thank you. Does anybody here have a solar system on their house? We have two. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. It's always good to know I've got friends in the audience. Yeah. I did. I, I really started in this early on. I, I think at one point I was the youngest person in solar energy, and now I'm the oldest person in solar energy. But we'll see some charts here that actually span my career. It's been fantastic. In, uh, in 1985, as Joseph mentioned, I was actually the VP of corporate marketing of combustion engineering, the, lar the, manufacturer, the largest manufacturer in the world of coal-fired boilers. So I was the chief marketeer of coal-fired power in the whole world when I was 35. How many of you were 35? Okay, you're close. So when I was young, I had one of these wonderful jobs, and I had to think about, what am I doing? Uh, it was good to have a nice job, but then you think, what am I doing? And I knew about solar PV uh, because I had done the first national study on solar PV for Jimmy Carter when he was president of the U.S. in 1977. And I still have a copy of that report. It seems like yesterday to me, but it was a long time ago. So in 90, 95, 96, as Joseph said, I came back to it and said, I only want to do solar energy. I knew about it. I'd done the other things and said, I don't want to do those things. I want to do this. And it's been wonderful 20 years ever since, working in Africa, working in India, uh, working in China, in Europe, um, and so forth. So it's been, fa it's been a fantastic time. But I'll share with you sort of just a little perception of solar energy. Where is it today? Where is it going? What can you do about that? And let me start with uh, this picture. You know, when you see a picture of the Earth that's just a big ball, you think, I can't do anything with that. That's too big for me. That's a big rock. I can't affect that. But when you see this picture, this changed my perception completely when I saw this picture many years ago, and I still use it because it shows how thin the atmosphere is. When you look up, you don't realize that. And if you notice here, there's a little bump. I don't see how this works. Anyway, you see a little bump there. That's a thundercloud. And if you notice, it caps off. And why does it cap off? Because there's, a little bit, there's no air above it. That's where the real atmosphere ends, at about 50,000 feet. And that's why the Concorde flew at 50,000 feet. There's not much above that. It's so thin. And if you can imagine 100 years of the Industrial Revolution spewing emissions up into that very thin uh, atmosphere, now you can start to imagine how we can affect climate and what's going on with our atmosphere and how we could ruin it so easily and quickly because it has such limited capacity. So this is what got my attention to work on these things. We're truly dealing with the need to transform society before we lose society, because once we lose it, it's over. We cannot rebuild the atmosphere if we ruin it. So this was my motivation to do something about this. And the fact is, as you all know, and you've seen these charts before, i just do it quickly, that the actual facts are the gases are building up in that atmosphere at stunning levels, starting only in 1900, booming now in CO2 up 40%, Methane up 150 percent, NOx up 20 percent, and and just look at the steep. This it's not stopping, you know. It's not going to stop tomorrow and go flat. No, it's keeping going up. It's a little bit terrifying once you've seen the picture of the atmosphere. 
And the fact is that translates as a matter of fact into the last three decades have been successively the hottest decades in all of history. And this is actually a picture of it done by the UN IPCC that, and you see the scale at the bottom. On average, the color code will tell you we've already increased the temperature of the atmosphere by one degree. Did you all know that already? By one degree. We've already done one degree. And the, and the global commitment just in December was to try to stop it uh, at two degrees and maybe a degree and a half. Well, unfortunately, do you know we put up the emissions already? Already. If we stopped emissions today, full stop, we've already put up enough that the temperature is going to go up 1.7 degrees Celsius. We've already exceeded the, the aspirational goal of 1.5 that was in the Paris Agreement. Why did they agree to something that we've already passed? Just to make themselves feel good. That's what. We've, we've already done enough to go 1.7. So how high is this going to go? And the scariest thing on this chart this is not the red. It's actually the little piece of blue. You see the blue up there? That's the cold water coming off the ice melt from Greenland. It's actually happening already, and they can measure that. And when that goes down a little bit further, the whole Gulf Stream effect stops. And all the warmth you have here in the Netherlands will turn to cold because you're, you're at the same level as northern Canada and Siberia. And this place will be frozen in a very short period of time. It's very scary what's happening. And the journalists don't seem to be conveying this as accurately as they need to do. So what about now we turn to solutions or actually and the solutions we're trying and I like the International Energy Agency for its efforts to try to plan out, okay, what can we do as humans? How can we all get on the same page? And they plotted out four different scenarios where if we keep going, it's a disaster. If we have new policies like the Paris Agreement, okay, we slow it down. And if we have a very efficient world, we slow it down more. But what we have to be on, what they call the 450 scenario, 450 parts per million of CO2 or greenhouse gases, if we limit it at that, and, and we're crossing 400 now, if we limit it to 450, that gets, stops at a two degrees. Look what we have to do to stop it at two degrees. We basically have to shut down the fossil fuel industries. This is a major thing, and we have to have solutions to do that because we can't just stop. We have to replace with something new. Well, what is something new? Then we get to solar energy. And so the solutions that I see to that same chart is we need solutions that are efficient, smart, clean, renewable, and decarbonize. These five words should guide what we go forward. Rather than trying to stop what we've been doing, very difficult. We have to replace with new and better, and these are the things. And I would submit to you that only one technology does all five of those things. And that's why when I came back to renewables, and I do all renewables, and I do energy efficiency financing, all of these things, but the one that does it all is solar. And it's not so new. It was actually first observed in 1839 by a scientist, a French scientist named Becquerel, who observed that light hitting certain metals would cause the electrons to buzz. So that was the first observation of the photovoltaic effect. But the most important event was Einstein himself. How many of you know Einstein wrote the special theory of relativity? Yes, everyone knows that? Okay, everyone knows that. How many of you knew he didn't get the Nobel Prize for that? When he got the Nobel Prize, yeah, all the people in the industry only, he got it for the mathematical explanation of the photovoltaic effect. That's what got him the Nobel Prize. The Nobel Committee considered that more important than the special theory of relativity. It was just brilliant to be able to explain mathematically what a photon of energy is, a photon of light, how much energy it has, and how the energy uh, displaces electrons within the atomic structure of materials. That was impressive to the Nobel Committee. So this is where it really launched. And of course, there's been every year successive scientific discoveries since then. So now we have the solution for what he was imagining in his brain of a solar cell invented by Bell Labs, as you know, made into modules, made into systems, and now we have the whole package and it's functional. After literally, Becquerel was 1839, we're 2016, we're almost 200 years since the first observation of this effect. This didn't start yesterday, it's not over tomorrow. This has been a tremendous series of scientific discoveries and industrial evolutions. Now what's happened, as you have seen before, is the price has come down 
so dramatically as actually imagined in that study I did in 1977, published in 1978, for the Carter White House, is the beginning of this chart. Can you believe that? And that $76 there is a little bit not true. You could actually, in dollars those days, you could buy a, a panel that looked just like that from Sharp, the Japanese company, for $11 a watt. $11 a watt times three for inflation would be $33, call it $35. The $76 was actually what you could buy a solar cell for for your spacecraft, okay? But the actual on-the-ground solar system for your roof, which looked then just like it does today, $11 a watt, you could buy one. And, and yet the goal was 50 cents a watt, 50 cents a watt. My study, we concluded, which I did on a TI-1250 calculator and a long list of, of paper running numbers, um, the goal was not, could not be 50 cents, it had to be 8 cents, 8 cents a watt to be able to compete energy to energy in the grid. We projected it had to be 8 cents, and this seemed highly unlikely that it was going to go from $11 a watt to 8 cents in my lifetime. Well, guess what? It's at 30 cents. And if you multiply 8 cents times 3, that's 24 cents. We were pretty accurate. In, in calculating what it would take for this technology to actually penetrate the market as a commercial technology. We were saying 24 cents, it's already at 30 cents and booming in the market. So we knew back then, this wasn't discovered yesterday, the analytics were known. And as Michael Liebreich said uh, this morning in another speech, you know, if you could run a calculator with a 20% 20, uh, 20 learning curve, you could predict as where this was going. And look, it happened, amazing, we're there, we're there and it's gonna keep going. And so what's happened is the growth of installations globally has followed a, an amazingly steady curve. And this is a logarithmic paper, so it actually escalates like that. But the steadiness of this curve tells you what? It tells you where it's going. It's not, it's not gonna to stop tomorrow. This is where it's going. And we're already crossing 200,000 gigawatts, straight line up to 10,000 gigawatts, up to 100,000 gigawatts, and how many gigawatts are installed in the entire world of all power generation? 5,000 gigawatts. And this is headed for 10,000. This is headed for twice of all the electricity in the world, which tells me in my daughter's lifetime, and my older daughter works for NRG selling solar systems, by the way, selling in the family. Yeah, it's true. And the other one works for HSBC, and she's financing them. So we're all in this together. It's going there. It's going to be 100% of all the electricity in the world, or could be, the way it's going. There's no stopping this line. So I'm absolutely confident where this is headed. The vision of Thomas Edison, I know you can't read this, but I'll read it, it's fascinating, that this was actually a conversation that was recorded by a man who was there. And it's, it's actually written in a book called Uncommon Friends by James Newton. He says, Edison began the conversation with a provocative remark about the possible depletion of resources in the future. And Edison said, we are like tenant farmers chopping down the fence around our house for fuel when we should be using nature's inexhaustible sources of energy, sun, wind, and tide. It sounds like uh, Barack Obama. I mean, this is, this is Thomas Edison almost 100 years ago. And then uh, George Firestone from the Firestone, these guys hung around together. It's a little like Steve Jobs and, and, and Gates and all, you know, it's uh, industry leaders. So Firestone, he responded that oil and coal wouldn't last us forever. And, and uh, Ford, running Ford Motor Company, said there was enormously powerful tides. For example, the Bay of Fundy, scientists had only begun playing with that question so far. And then finally, Edison says, and this is his famous quote, I'd put my money on the sun and solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. I wish I had more years left. It's fantastic he had this vision. So I feel like um, he's talking to you like I was talking to my daughters. I mean, I wish I was my daughters you know, with the next, the next 50 or 100 years to go. And the, the fun thing is that a baby born today, I don't know if you know this, a baby born today on average will live to 105 years old. Did you know that? Life expectancies are growing so fantastic. Uh, so anyway, she'll have a good time with this. But that's Thomas Edison, and he was an old guy. And so, you know, you can't really relate to him. But I found this other picture of Thomas Edison that I thought was more appropriate for this, for today. And that is Thomas Edison when he was a college student because he was like you, and he looks just like you, by the way. Turn around, look at this guy with his hand by his face. All right, what is your name? Turn around. Doesn't he look like Thomas Edison? That's amazing. 
Fantastic. There he is. There's you. <laughs> and that was my point of this photograph, which is everybody has their dreams. Even Thomas Edison was your age. He had visions and he had dreams. And then he, he committed his life to make those dreams come true. And look what he did. It's fantastic. But he was, long, he was young like you at one point in time. And I wonder if he imagined that only just one life ta lifetime past his own, we were dealing with the space lab powered by solar photovoltaics, which he was imagining. And we were powering our houses in the Netherlands and Germany and every place in the world now. It's actually happening at a scale, a fantastic scale. And it's even happening in the rural areas where it's affecting lives. And I personally started the first off-grid solar company in Africa in 1997. It's called the Shell Escom Solar Company. And we did over 10,000 homes, uh, homes that never had electricity. These are Rondevels in the Eastern Cape and KwaZulu-Natal in, in uh, South Africa. And in the Eastern Cape, our company actually did Nelson Mandela's village without us knowing it was his village. And he called us up, or his office called us and said he wanted to hold a party to inaugurate our company. So it was, it was a two day Woodstock at his village where Shell came in and set up a stage and the people came from all around and it was a two day fantastic, thousands of people. And he flew in in his helicopter gunship Actually, I thought it was a security gunship and then because it had missiles on it and then he climbed out. So that's how he traveled. And so I got to meet Nelson Mandela in his village for having put solar on on the houses, the Rondevels in his village. And I have never personally been at the installation of a solar system on a house that had no electricity till then that, that the, the family didn't cry every single time they will break out in tears as to how this affects their lives. To have light at night, to have a new, a new way of life and how it affects them. It's very motivating. If, how many of you have ever done solar in rural Africa? No, it's been, everybody should do that for a week in your life. Volunteer with somebody and go do it. It'll change your life. And so where we are in the end is we've invented this thing. And the question is, what can we make of it? And we've made wonderful things of it. Spacecraft, on our homes, on the grid, uh, we've put it on rendezvous in Africa. We've changed people's lives. And I've already told you, in my view, this is going to 100%. The world will someday be powered, and we will achieve, not soon, but in the end, we will achieve that curve, that 450 curve that brings it all the way down, no more emissions. Otherwise, we won't have a society. But it's very motivating to know that some people back in the 70s, not just me, but others, envision that this could happen invested the money to, to, to make it happen, and now we're operating at scale. So we've come a long way, and my message is, I've done my thing for 40 years, and I'm asking you, Mr. Thomas Edison, that'll change your life, won't it, knowing that you look like Thomas Edison. So I'm saying it's up to you to make this happen. I've taken it from, and my peers have taken it from zero to where we are today, an equal leap from here forward will electrify the whole world. So I hope you will go do that. So I thank you for having me, and I'm very pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. It's extremely inspiring. Thomas Edison, nice to know that you're with us here today. It's an honor. Uh, I'm here. We'll open the floor to any questions. So what are your thoughts on uh, wind energy? Wind? Yeah. Yeah. Um, wind is the early winner um, as we have a huge industry now. But in the long run, I think wind um, will be huge. And it's, I finance it now. It's, they're great. Very commercial, really works, very reliable, very cheap, uh, very clean, but the, the location of the best sites will eventually get used up. So instead of growing exponentially with no limit like this, which is solar's potential, right? Wind has grown rapidly and is slowly maturing. And, and solar, I don't see ever maturing. It just keeps going. It's like computers. It's like the internet. It just, it just keeps going. And we'll just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as we just electrify. So I think they're equally good today. Uh, in fact, uh, this next year, the installation of PV and the installation of wind in the world will be equal for the first time at 60 gigawatts, 60,000 megawatts each. 
Uh, next year's predicted wind will be 63 gigawatts, and one of the major predictions is PV will be 64 gigawatts in one year. So solar will finally, so we have a curve going like this and a curve going like this, and, th and this year they cross. Why do you think it's this year? I mean, I'm just, that's the facts. It's just solar, it's is, solar is taking off and wind is levelizing. And so they just happen to be crossing this very year. Coincidentally, they're still huge. Um, you know, they're both on average about $2 a watt to install, a little more, a little less. Um, and so that's $120 billion each. It's a pretty big number. So this year will be 120 billion, actually be about 150 billion for PV and about 120 billion for wind. So PV will already be bigger money-wise than wind. Same in, in megawatts. Any other questions? Well, thank you for a very inspiring talk. I'm one of the older guys who's yeah. persistent. So anyway, I've done my job a little bit, but I have a little bit more ahead of me, I think. Um, I, I hope to see in my time that the cost will reduce to eight cents present day a watt. What do you think is possible or needed? Or what would be the bottom price that you can really reach? Because at some point the experience curve will have to drop or have to remain constant, I would say. Well, uh, the question is uh, the eight cents. Uh, the eight cents was in 1990, $1975. So that's the same as 24 cents today. And we're already at 30 cents as the lowest price. So we're, we're already in the same, we're already in the right space. Uh, from here on, PV will keep going down at 20% for every doubling of the cumulative amount produced. So when we've, we've produced, uh, to date, I showed you, we've, we've produced about 200 gigawatts of PV, cumulative total. So when we've produced another 200 gigawatts, Cumulative, so to double the total, right? When when we're at 400 gigawatts total, the price, or the cost will be 20% lower than today. That's the learning curve, and so you take 20 off of 30, 20% off 30. That's six cents. We'll be at the 24 cents. So we're going to hit exactly the number I mentioned when we're at 400 gigawatts installed, which is twice what we have today. So it'll keep going down. The industry translates that so regular people can understand it. It's running, it's, it's coming down still at about 5 to 10% per year, roughly, in that realm. Uh, and you can see that happening. So, I mean, we're, we're in the winning zone already. And it, it actually does, I believe it just keeps going forever. You know, the cost of memory chips just keeps going down. It'll never stop going down. This is semiconductors. Uh, how many of you know what a diode, electronic device called a diode, you have transistors and you have diodes. Anybody know what a diode is? Yeah, a couple of people know it. Well, actually, a solar cell is a diode. It is a semiconductor device that allows electricity to flow in one direction only. And it accelerates that with the energy. So it's an empowered diode is what it is. So as an electronic device, as a semiconductor device, the cost reduction will never stop. As if production increases, the cost will be coming down. And again, that builds my confidence I'm an electrical engineer by training, so I, I feel like I believe that. It's really going to happen. It, is, it has happened, it is happening, and it will continue to happen, without doubt. So that's the key question. Where's cost going? Because this is, we're all motivated to save the Earth environmentally and climate-wise, but the fact is the market doesn't buy power generation because we like it. It buys it because it's the lowest cost thing. So now wind is already the lowest cost uh, energy generator and solar is right behind it. So cost is the key. What do you do? What is your job? I'm a university professor of working on solar energy. Oh, really? So that's why. What I, university? Uh, Utrecht University. So oh, Utrecht here. right here. Yeah, yes. So we have a regional Utrecht exposition uh, here. So you can perhaps visit. Well, this talk to the professor, huh? Yeah, yes. good. All right. Okay. I'm okay. an adjunct professor at Columbia University okay. and I taught a course on clean energy finance in China. Interesting course, yeah. Yeah, to Chinese so, people. Yeah, yeah, to Chinese people. Half the students at Columbia are Chinese. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's take one final question. Uh, two. From Thomas, from, yes. from, from Mr. Edison down there. A special guest. Um, 
Yes, so there's a lot of uh, competition to the current uh, crystalline solar cells and modules. What is your view on how long will that dominate the market and others will take over? Okay, so we have uh, several kinds of solar PV. There's what's called monocrystalline, and it appears to be black uh, when you see one. And that's made from, um, um, they, they create a crystal of silicon and then slice it. And it's just pure silicon, and monocrystalline it's called. It's one, one big crystal and they slice it. There's another kind called uh, multi-crystalline silicon, and that's where they break up the silicon and, and remelt it. And you wouldn't believe it would work, but it looks, it looks uh, blue and, and scattered and broken. And that's the dominant type now. It's amazing that that works. And then there's thin film, which is the chemical vapor deposition on glass or metal of the semiconductor materials in a gaseous form that then settles and it do it in different layers to create the photovoltaic effect. And so there's thin film and there's several kinds of thin film. And the current uh, market shares are about 10% uh, thin film, 30% monocrystalline, and 60% multicrystalline. And amazingly enough, because monocrystalline is more expensive than the multicrystalline, you think this would be gaining. Well, this did gain in the past 30 years, the multicrystalline, to the disadvantage of, of the mono. Uh, but actually, mono is gaining back because it has higher efficiencies. And if you're putting it on your roof, then you're space limited, so you want to get as much power as possible. So many people are selecting the higher cost, high efficiency mono, and it's been gaining. And to everyone's surprise, the thin film uh, PV, which everybody predicted would cost zero almost, in theory, that hasn't caught on as well uh, because it turns out to be very difficult to manufacture at high volume. Sp you know, that chemical vapor deposition, if, if the plates are going by about this fast, it's hard to get uniformity of that deposition. So many companies have tried and failed and gone bankrupt trying to get their manufacturing process to work. In the lab, it works great, but uh, high volume manufacturing, much more difficult. Only one company has cracked that case and that's First Solar. And the issue with them is they, which I, they're a client of mine and, and they're a great company, but they have a technical limitation that is cadmium telluride. Cadmium is a very deadly material. It's banned in Japan, for example. Um, and it has to be recycled in Europe. And so you might not want cadmium on your roof, even though it's probably pretty safe, but it's just not a good marketing story. So they tend to specialize in, in its lower efficiency so they specialize in utility scale, very large scale projects in the desert, big utility scale, because utilities are fine with cadmium, no big deal to them. And then they recycle those, those uh, plates anyway. But that's, they have different market applications and the competition. What's happened is the Japanese, I mean, rather the Chinese, when they really came into it in 2010, they all specialized in the multi-crystalline technology and drove the cost down. So I compare multi-crystalline technology to a internal combustion engine. The reason we still buy them is because we have factories that make them. And they keep making them. And they won't stop. And they keep making them. And we keep buying them. And so, but if you ever had to restart, uh, you wouldn't have internal combustion engines. Uh, but multi-crystalline, we're buying it because they're making it. And they're making a lot of it in a very low cost. And so it's going to be around for a long time. One final question. Yes. What about uh, the cycles of energy, renewable energy? Sorry? What about the uh, cycles of uh, renewable energy? Like uh, we have a project in El the island of El Hierro that we are um, making circles of energy with uh, wind energy and with water. Circles of energy? Yeah, it's because, uh, for example, uh, we are putting in the, um, I don't, the cliff uh, the wind. Uh, you mean pump storage? Yes, and later we pu pump the, yeah, the pump water storage. from the sea to the uh, up, and later sure. we throw it to, again to the sea, producing like energy all the time. Yeah, uh, but what what the lady is describing is, um, does everybody know what pump storage is? And no, you, no. What it is is, you build a lake at the top of a mountain. And then there's a reservoir at the bottom of the mountain. And at nighttime, when there's excess electricity, 
and the price of electricity is very cheap, like two cents a kilowatt hour. You you use that electricity conventional to run pumps to pump the water up to the top of the mountain. Now it's at the top of the mountain, and you can let it run down as a hydro project during the day, when it's very when the electricity is very expensive, twenty cents a kilowatt hour. Okay, and so you're you're arbitraging the difference between the two cents and the twenty cents by moving water up and down. It's very well known, very big used in the U.S. And the lady is saying, how about if you use wind power as the energy to pump it up? Now you've got pure, clean energy, and you can deliver it anytime you want. Anytime you need electricity, you just run the hydro project running down, and you generate. You don't have to take the wind power when it's, when it's first generated. You can use it more smartly, and that's a great application. So yes, yes, and same with PV. You can, there is a PV project like that in the Philippines that the World Bank financed about 10 years ago. Exactly that, big PV array for electricity to run a pumped hydro. It's a good idea. Okay, I think I'm gonna turn it over to my friend who's, uh, we met this morning at a conference upstairs, so I'm looking forward to your talk too. Before Thank you leave, you we have a little gift for you. Cool. And uh, please, one more big round of applause. Uh, Thank you so much. There's always something beautiful about seeing someone who knows so much about a particular subject. And, and just a happenstance to run into Thomas Edison. That's <laughs> <amazing>. <laughs> hey, thank you so much. Thank you.